Hello everyone, this is Michael from Ancient Greece Revisited and this is another book review. Um, it's summer, so we're part of the, a little disorganized vibe and um, it might be a good chance to segue off to this other segment of our show, which is book reviews. Uh, we had another one that we just published and this one is also going to be about a very special book, um, which is called The Gnostic Religion subtitled The Message of the Alien God by one Hans Jonas. Um, Hans Jonas is part of this group that has been fascinating to me and to our show, um, which is sometimes called the Conservative Revolution, which happened between the First and Second World Wars in Germany, the so-called uh, Weimar Republic, uh, of which someone like Martin Heidegger and even someone like Leo Strauss are parts of. And um, Hans Jonas was a member of this very loosely coupled group. I don't think they ever called themselves the conservative revolutionaries, but uh, uh, that's what they are for us now, so many decades later. And Hans Jonas was on the front of religion, religious studies, philosophy. He was a student of Martin Heidegger, who's perhaps the towering giant of this group uh, introduced a very new version of phenomenology. And Hans Jonas became fascinated with this so-called religion, which we call Gnosticism, which is not, as he presents in his book, exactly a religion. It's a religious tendency, it's a religious orientation, which means that various religions became Gnostic as the times progressed. Now, to jump to the present, many of you might have been introduced to Gnosticism without even knowing um, through a book and then film, um, The Da Vinci Code, a very, very popular, very popular book, very, very popular film. And The Da Vinci Code it presents some kind of conspiracy theory, right, whereby the Vatican, organized religion as such, is trying to hide or is actually hiding an ancient manuscript which show, shows Jesus um, and the religion that he created under very different light, um, not under the light of the papacy, not under the light of organized religion, uh, a more liberal, perhaps, Jesus or Jesus that most today could more easily relate. And I don't even remember if the actual book that was this hidden treasure was quoted, but for us who've done a little bit of digging, um, it was the Gospel of Thomas. Okay, the Gospel of Thomas is part of the so-called apocryphal, which is a Greek word for hidden, Gospels, the secret Gospels. Um, not because they were actually hidden, these texts circulated um, through various times, although a big renaissance of Gnosticism happened uh, when a lot of texts were discovered in Egypt uh, in the 1950s. Uh, but they were largely alone. We made a, a show about the Hermetic texts, for instance, which are an instance of Gnosticism. They were perhaps the Hellenic version, the Greek version of Gnosticism, while something like the Gospel of Thomas uh, was the Christian version of Gnosticism. And what I have found, because I have almost went through a Gnostic phase myself, not Gnostic necessarily in the belief, but just being fascinated by this obscure religious tendency. And um, I read a small number of books and I found that, you know, I'm always trying to get to the most authoritative. And I found that a lot of them present a very one-sided version of Gnosticism. They take Gnosticism under the prism of a specific religion. Like, for example, uh, the Gospel of Thomas, which is just the Greek version. Um, or, or, or the Hermetic texts, which is the Greco-Egyptian version of Gnosticism. Hans Jonas does the opposite. He presents us with an overview of the whole uh, Gnostic spectrum that includes things like uh, the religion of the prophet Mani, Manichaeanism, which is a very forgotten term, but back in his days, um, Mani had created a religion that was almost as powerful as Islam. Um, and for historical reasons, I guess, it did not went through. Um, lots of beautiful stories, like this, the so-called Hymn of the Pearl. And Hans Jonas, in his book, presents an overview, the most holistic view of Gnosticism that I have found. But this is not why I was so attracted to this book, ironically enough. It's not the encyclopedic nature. It's 
Um, the, the way he begins and he declares his views uh, very forcefully is what caught me. He begins by saying this, which you might want to think about after this video ends because it's so powerful. He says, two are the moments in world history that nihilism becomes a dominant culture. Entire human history, there are only two moments where nihilism, instead, instead of a subculture, becomes the main culture the time of the Gnostics and our time. You might argue against the second, but my interest in the so-called conservative revolution obviously revolves around the idea that yes, we do live in somewhat decadent times. But you might say, you know, look at the world around you. Would you rather live in the Middle Ages or, or in ancient Greece for that matter? And the answer is no. You know, I usually say that you only need a toothache to understand what modern science has done for us. You know, you just have this little nerve in your mouth that's hurting and your life is ruined, quite frankly, for a day or three days. And then you go to the doctor, little injection, little operation, and it's gone as if by magic. This, these powers would probably be considered magic in another time. So you only need to hurt a little bit to understand the importance of modern science. Yet, at the same time, um, this was not dissimilar to the time of the Gnostics. The time of the Gnostics have some eerie similarities to our own time. And for their cultural context, it was the equivalent of modernity. Theirs, and we're talking about the late Greek world, right? After the conquest of Alexander, so after ancient Greece proper, had ceased to exist in a way after the great Peloponnesian War, the war between Athens and Sparta that brought down Athens and started the decline of the city-states, the independent city-states that made up the Greek world. Then Philip of Macedon conquers Greece, unites Greece, creates something that could be called Greece as modern Greeks understand it, like the whole world, um, this whole uh, peninsula in, in, in the southeast of the Mediterranean being one. And then his son Alexander obviously conquers pretty much the rest of the known world and unites it in a first version of globalism. And the sciences, talking about sciences, flourished because then you have this circulation of ideas that makes science so powerful. Um, inventions in Babylon could be uh, inseminated by theories of the Pythagoreans and create new things. Remember at the end, near the end of the Hellenistic period, you almost had steam engines you had machines that moved through steam, which is what created the modern world thousands of years later. It's just that these machines were never put to use. Who knows exactly why, some say, because they had so many slaves that they didn't need them. But I mean, the technology was there, pretty advanced. The Egyptians made, like, had brain surgery discovered, their, 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 their skulls that show actual successful brain surgery. So it's not the science they were lacking. And something else was missing. And they created this religion or religious tendency called Gnosticism, which at its core is very nihilistic. And that's what Hans Jonas explores. The first thing he notices, and it's quite important, is that in this globalized world that was the Hellenic world, um, there was this phenomenon of unrootedness. Okay, so cultures that were local, they were unrooted by, first of all, their, uh, their, 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 their culture being assimilated to a larger empire, so no longer being independent. And then by being, uh, becoming travelers, like a lot of ancient empires had this, had this um, tool whereby they would relocate po conquered populations and they would mix them up and the Babylonians and Assyrians did it and the Romans inherited from that and would mix up populations. So you could find an entire village that was once in the Middle East being somewhere in the Balkans. And e e even without that, you had people just traveling out of curiosity like people travel today. But the cultural context was lost. So for instance, Socrates famously, um, you know, he was asked why he never leaves Athens, right? Why he never goes out to the countryside. And he replied, because um, trees cannot teach me anything. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a creature of ancient Athens. Even near his death, he was given the chance of escaping Athens or facing his death in Athens. 
and we know he chose the latter. Socrates without Athens is inconceivable because his whole theory begins with the issues, the political issues that naturally occurred as city-states became independent and experimented in self-governance. All the great theories that we read are extensions of the very practical problems that one would find in the agora, the marketplace where political ideas were discussed, which is perhaps why a lot of these platonic dialogues are dialogues in the first place, because the Greeks discussed, should we wage war, should, should we start a commercial route? Um, and building on that, Socrates reached some very, very high spiritual levels. Um, Socrates could never have left Athens, but Socratic philosophy did when Greece and Babylon became united in this international world. Um, Platonic philosophers could mix with uh, Buddhist monks and Zoroastrian priests and e Egyptian necromancers all on, on these huge commercial um, freeways that were opened back in the times of Alexander and after, and they would exchange ideas. But these ideas, they had lost the context in which uh, they were created. So a lot of their elements were lost, and only the very universalist tendencies within them were uh, retained. You know, like today, you might hear, especially online, by various internet gurus, uh, Tim Ferriss is one that comes to mind. Um, there's almost like a revival of Stoicism, you know, people teach you, teach you how to be a Stoic. Um, we have to remember that Stoicism was born exactly then, when Greece became uprooted, and only these very universalist tendencies um, w remained, and where the effort was no longer political change, which you find very obvious in Plato and Aristotle. Um, freedom, freedom that the Greeks valued so much, stopped becoming a social issue and became an internal issue, an issue whereby you have to seek and find peace only within you. You have to fix it in your mind. You have to see things, see your life from the point of view, and boom, you're free. That's not something that Socrates would ever say, the ancient Greeks would ever say, but Greek philosophy turned stoic right when it lost its roots inside of the Greek world. Star signs are another example. Star signs were part of the Zoroastrian tradition. The Magi, the high priests of the Persian Empire, would study the stars and they would calculate the offsprings and the generations of kings and who should inherit what and how he should rule based on the stars. Zodiac signs, you and I were never meant to have zodiac signs. Um, only the kings were meant to have zodiac signs. And who knows, you know, when you have such a close-knitted family where everyone is marrying their first or second cousin and uh, their uh, marriages and lives are so prearranged, who knows, perhaps zodiac signs can work then, you know, when you have such a controlled system. Um, but zodiac signs as well, uh, astrology became unrooted. It lost the context of the Persian court, the royal court where it was supposed to function, and became an idea that circulated. So Hans Jonas presents us uh, this Hel Hellenistic world is, is, is a postmodern world, a, a world of pastiche philosophies where things just mix and mingle. And he is right. It is something about globalization that does that. And perhaps it's the reason why you have this, um, this uh, effort the, to understand Stoicism and the writings of Marcus Aurelius by someone like Tim Ferriss, you know, because it's very fit to our time. But here in Ancient Greek Revisited, we're actually trying to do the opposite. We're trying to go back to when Greek philosophy was rooted in its political traditions and trying to think almost like, uh, like ancient Greeks. Um, Hans Jonas presents us with this idea and then gives us a view of of, of, of Gnosticism, and like I said, it's en encyclopedic. He mentions the Gospels of Thomas, the Apocryphal uh, Gospels, the, the Gospel of Mary, which is very interesting. There is um, this Apocryphal Gospel which was supposed to be written by Mary Magdalene, and it begins, or at least the version that we have saved, begins with a very strange question towards Jesus. Uh, Mary Magdalene, the famous, the sinful woman, turns to the teacher and says, Master, says, 
what is matter? Matter, like physical matter, like what is it? What's a mystery? And that is very Gnostic because the Gnostics believe that matter is inherently corrupt. Uh, so this world of matter could not have been created by a good God, as we're taught in the Bible. The Gnostics believe that this world must have been created by what they called a demiurge, which is a, a, a world, a word that comes from Plato's uh, Timaeus, uh, Dimiurgos in Greek, essentially, demiurge. The creator, the creator God can, cannot be a good God. A good God would never be a creator, according to the Gnostics. That, that is the basic premise. So whatever happens in this world um, is a lost cause, essentially. Political change is a lost cause. We can't do anything but escape. It's a philosophy of escapism. And uh, we find this escapism today in the modern world. And um, if you buy this book, as I recommend, and if you read it, there's um, an epilogue in the second version. So please buy the second edition of this book because there's an epilogue whereby um, I won't do, relate the whole thing, but uh, Hans Jonas being a student of Martin Heidegger, presents himself as someone who uh, studies with Heidegger. Um, get, I don't know if he got his PhD, but he studied enough to deserve one. And he embark, he presents himself as embarking off the shores of the modern world, where Heidegger was this imposing figure. He gets in the boat towards Gnosticism, trying to understand this obscure religion, using the boat that Heidegger built, right? So Heidegger... Uh, build this boat, which was phenomenology, and Hans Jonas thought that using phenomenology he could penetrate into the seas of Gnosticism. And then he presents a, a, a metaphor whereby he's almost lost at sea, he almost becomes a Gnostic, he almost has some kind of awakening, it would seem. And then he comes back with this boat, and he sees this shore that he left, and he sees Heidegger, and he realizes that it's not Gnosticism that must be interpreted by modern philosophy. It's modern philosophy that must be interpreted from the point of view of Gnosticism. In other words, Jonas believed that we do live in Gnostic times right now, right here, thinking we're going to go to the moon and create a transhumanist future. And that's inherently the problem, it would seem. Um, the last part of this epilogue is a very, very deep point, which I'm not going to mention because I want you to um, to read, and he actually gives you the core, the essence of what is wrong, and it has something to do with temporality and the way we experience time and, and eternity. And oh, I won't ruin it because for me it was quite a moment reading it. I had this like big aha moment. Um, so that that's a book that you'll hear more about from us. And um, please, uh, we do rely on your support. So subscribe, like, and consider our Patreon uh, support. Thank you very much. Have a great summer. And we'll keep on churning new and great, hopefully, episodes.